and several other magazines, and I saw lying on the ocean floor plates, cooked glass doors, wine bottles, even a chamber pot. These things clearly visible on the ocean floor. The crow's nest from which a man by the name of Fred Fleet rang the bell and gave the last warning message was photographed and I looked at it in Life magazine. This man was standing there trying to keep watch and up ahead a quarter of a mile away he saw the looming menacing sight of an iceberg and he did the best he could to warn the people but the ship was going too fast and it was too late to turn aside and the ship sank. Now it is no more a memorial than a tomb for National Geographic says scavengers have long since devoured the bodies that were entombed inside of that wreck. A current writer writing about the Titanic says why this unceasing fascination with this tragedy? Then he answers his own rhetorical question by saying, people are forever interested in the Titanic because that ship represented the zenith of security and safety which man could provide. That ship had the ultimate guarantee that it could not sink. And whoever wrote on it was guaranteed to be safe and guaranteed to be alive at the end of the destination. They only had 20 lifeboats. At least that's how many pulled away from the ship and all of them were not fully loaded. The Titanic, the makers, the crew felt that extra lifeboats were superfluous. Why do we need lifeboats when the whole ship is a lifeboat? It can't sink. From up on the bridge, the captain could control three compartments. And if they should have a catastrophe and three compartments filled with water, he could push buttons and seal them off. And the Titanic still, they said, could have made her harbor. They considered lifeboats, therefore, purely ornamental, unnecessary. They called their ship unsinkable. There is a woman who is probably still alive. She was seven years old on that night. Her name, Eva Hart. Her father died aboard the Titanic. She and her mother sat side by side in a lifeboat. And her mother had a premonition that something was going to go wrong. She would not get into bed in her stateroom. She told her daughter, I don't like men saying this ship is unsinkable. This seems to fly in the face of God. Ah, <laughs> oh, what a journey. The ship's roster read like the blue book of New England. Everybody who was anybody had made a trip to Europe in order to be on board. There was going to be one big party all the way from England to New York. The richest passenger aboard was John Jacob Astor. But when tragedy struck, he thought being who he was, surely they'd let him get in the lifeboat. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a lesson here somewhere. That salvation has little to do with money. The old Negro spiritual says if religion were a thing that money could buy, then the rich would live and the poor would die. And when they told him he couldn't get on board, he went over on starboard side and climbed up on a little bridge. And there he began to sulk and contemplate his millions and realize that none of it could help him now. And with an explosion, one of the ship's funnels fell directly upon him. They found his body floating in the ice water, terribly, horribly mangled. That's National Geographic, December 1985. Men and women on board were in high blood. They had on their best garments. They had stored their state rooms with the best of furs, the best of gowns, and the best of jewelry. I read somewhere that one room cost 
thousand three hundred and fifty dollars. In today's money, that's more than fifty thousand dollars per state rule. They had their wine cellar stocked. Some of the wine bottles have been photographed on the ocean floor and identified as port and champagne and names I can't even pronounce. Bordeaux and Riesling, they are there on the ocean floor. A testimony that it pays to remember God. Put not your trust in princes. Don't put your trust in the guarantees of politicians. Don't put your trust in man in whom there is no help. Ladies and gentlemen, we ought to remember something yes, about this. Yes, the collision occurred at 11.15 p.m. And when this great ship struck the icebergs, it was so big and so strong, the passengers hardly felt it. The music kept on playing. The dance band was wound up. The people were foxtrotting in every parlor. Already, the hammer has fallen, but they didn't even know it. They continued their celebrating, their drinking, their dancing, their reveling. And yet doom had settled upon that ship. After a while, it slowed down. And the people wondered what's happening. And then they stopped those great engines. And instead of hearing the incessant mumbling of these giant machines plowing through the sea, all they could hear was the hissing of steam. Even then, few realized that anything had happened. There came a general call. Put on your life belts. Put on your life belts. These people thought somebody was playing a joke. Now it was required to have lifeboat drills. But never at night, especially on a night as peaceful and as beautiful as this one. The starlight reflected off the gently lapping waves. There was no storm. There were no huge breakers fighting against the side of the ship. What in the world is going on? The engineers kept the lights burning. That ship was so big it looked like a city island out there in the middle of the sea. And remember the sea was calm. The heavens were gracious. Nobody could understand that the end had come for more than 1,500 souls. Two hours and 40 minutes later, this great unsinkable ship raised herself up with a heave, pointed her bow down into the angry deep, and gently slid beneath the waves, waves of solid ice water at 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Ladies and gentlemen, those who escape say that for two hours almost, you could hear the moaning and the screaming of the damned and the doomed. And then there came that awful, that awesome silence. And men were dead. But ladies and gentlemen, what is this white star complex? This thing which I told the young people last night, Ellen White says, amazes the angels. This complex causes the angels to stand and watch us with incredulity. What is it? It is the tendency on the part of mortal human beings to ignore warnings. It is recorded that the Titanic had been repeatedly warned that an ice field lies in your path. Large floating icebergs are in the very area where you will be sailing. You can make it, but you gotta slow down. You gotta consider the danger. You can make it, but 
you got to slow down. You got to turn aside from the dancing and the carousing and the reveling and pay attention to the danger that lies in the water. But the arrogance of humanity said it doesn't matter. We don't care about the warnings. This ship can't see. Full speed ahead. It is recorded that the Titanic was going at 21 knots per hour. Too fast to adjust to danger. They, in fact, had no time for inconsequential caution. They had no time to listen to warnings. This was the Titanic. And on board were the most powerful men alive. 705, including the man that gave the last warning. Thank God he made it. Thank you. You know, it'd be a terrible thing for us to give the last warning and don't make it. I think about it all the time. night I saw three of my sisters here at Camp Me. A gaggle of nieces and nephews are here. One of my childhood buddies knocked on my motel door. He and I got converted at the same time. We stopped cussing the same week. He's here with his lovely wife and daughter. Of baptizing my own brother. Oh, the devil had him, but the Lord set him free. I baptized him. I watched him become deacon and then head deacon. After that, he became elder and then first elder. And since he makes a lot more money than us preachers, we preachers, I said to him, now that you're retired, come go with me to do Bible work. And he's been with me all over this country and in various parts of the world. He's a soul winner. I want to tell you all something right now. Even though I brought in by the grace of God into the truth, I don't want him to take my crown. Don't get his own. Rodriguez, the Lord, has called you and me and a host of my brethren here. The Lord has called us, told us to sound this warning. Let's offer prayer for this dear lady. If our nurses and doctors come quickly, please. The heat here is terrible. Please help her. Lord God, we need you right now. Lord, bless this dear lady. Bless her even as we continue with our sins. I beg it in Jesus' name. And for Jesus' sake. Amen. People got in those life bonds. 705, including the man who rang the bell and shouted the warning. But there were more than 2,200 men on board the Titanic. Of those in first class, it is reported that every child was saved. This is important. Every child in first class got in a lifeboat. But the poorer people were below decks. And the stairways and the hallways were blocked. And the children below deck died. I said to our young people last night, you don't have to be old and gray to die. Every day young people are being called into eternity. Therefore, I declare unto you that young people have better make some preparation to meet Jesus. Because somebody here is going to have to meet him without growing up. 
One writer said this, the sinking of the Titanic was the beginning of the age of insecurity. Are you listening? The sinking of the Titanic was the beginning of the age of insecurity. Men had believed that man could provide something absolutely positively unsinkable. But when it sank on its very first voyage, there rumbled in the hearts of men and women all across this world an understanding that man at his best cannot provide a guarantee. Man at his best cannot give us hope. Man at his best cannot offer salvation. And yet when the warnings come, when the warning comes, we tend to feel we don't need to listen to the warning. God is warning us every day and every night and all through the day. When we see catastrophe by land and sea and air, God is warning us on our dollar bills and on every coin in our pockets it says, in God we trust. But for most people, the money on which that is written is their God. Amen. Not long ago, there came a news flash out of Bogota, Colombia, South America. A mountain had erupted. After scores and scores of years, this mountain exploded in a volcano. There was a sleepy little village on the slopes of that mountain named the Mario. That village virtually disappeared. Billions of tons of ice and snow and hot lava mixed together and became a cauldron of devastation sweeping down the side of that mountain. But I read in an account that there were two mountain rivers up there. And when the landslide reached the rivers, it was temporarily arrested. And the people of Amerio, who were fearing for their lives, looked up and saw that the landslide had stopped at the river. So they went on to bed and fell asleep. And while they were sleeping, the bounds of the rivers gave way. And down the side of the mountain came an invincible man, a landslide of dark, sulfur stinking, paste like ooze, a sucking mud descended and carrying thousands and thousands of tons of rocks and trees. It swept away the entire city of Amerio. Some of those people are buried forever. Who was not moved by the picture of a little 12 year old girl buried in the sucking mud up to her neck for 60 hours they tried to get her out but could not finally after 60 hours that little girl said tell my mother I love her tell my father I love him and then her little heart ruptured in her breast and she died of a heart attack how terrible but listen to this CBS News said that seismologists have warned Columbia week in and week out that this tragedy was about to occur but nobody did anything about it 25,000 men, women and children died and the white city of Amerio became the Pompeii of South America the 
next day, the general conference issued a bulletin. It said the church, our church, in Amerio had 140 members. But every Sabbath, there were many visitors and scores of little children. When the devastation had done its work and the heads were counted, there were 35 Seventh-day Adventists left. A warning. A warning. But nobody listened. Nobody did anything about it. In the days of Noah, there went out a warning. For 120 years, Noah preached. For 120 years, God warned the people. Finally, God called Noah into the ark. And he went in and God shut the door. Next day was hot and sunny. Next day was hot and sunny. The people had been warned, but now they became bodacious in their rebellion. They began to organize picnics down by the side of the ark. They took turns laughing at Noah until the seventh day had passed. Noah was shut up in there with those stinking animals. Noah was shut up in there as the manure pile increased. Noah was shut up in there with a stifling heat. And the people met every day to make fun and mock and belittle Noah and to ignore the warning that God had sent. But on the seventh day, as I told the young people, they looked out on the horizon and they saw something unusual. There was a little dark cloud out there. They'd never seen one before in all of their lives. That little cloud just hung there on the horizon, beckoning. And as that cloud beckoned, other little dark clouds joined it. And then they put their hands together and became an invincible battalion of dark thunderheads. And then they began their inexorable march across the heavens. And the lightning flashed the code of God's anger. And the thunder bellowed his wrath. And all of a sudden they heard it. It rained, ladies and gentlemen. They had never seen rain before, but God told them rain was going to come. And didn't it rain, child? In A.D. 63, for some strange, enigmatic reason, a man took the streets of Jerusalem. That man was perhaps one of the first street evangelists. He began to walk up and down the streets of Jerusalem warning the people. He cried, woe, woe to Jerusalem, woe to the north and woe to the south, woe to the four winds. The people passed him off as being demented, but he kept when you do what God said. Over in Spain, we had a call porter. Now, they don't allow you to sell our books in Spain. At least they didn't then. Spain was a Catholic country, and they, by law, recruited Seventh-day Adventist call porters doing their work. But this man decided he had to do something for God. So he got his little books together, and he hit the streets, and it wasn't long before he locked him up. They had a trial. They pronounced him guilty. He paid his fine. They turned him loose. He got his little bag and went back to knock him on the What long for they arrested him again. And they carried him before the judge. Judge said, now look, you've been here once. Your fine is going to be double. Paid his fine. They turned him loose. He got his little bag and started knocking on door. After a while, the police took him in for the third time. And when he came before the judge, the judge said, What? Man, I must come to one conclusion. You must be crazy. The man said, Your Honor, would you give me a little paper indicating that? The judge said, Yeah. Saying this man is not physically and mentally well. Man took the paper, stuck it in his pocket, went out and started knocking on doors. Every time the police would stop him, he'd pull out his paper. The paper said, I'm crazy. St. Paul said, If I'm a fool, let me be a fool. 
Jesus Christ. When you walk in the ways of the Lord, they think you're crazy. When you carry a Bible to church, they think you're crazy. You got men running around with men, women running around with women. There's nothing too dirty or filthy that the public will not give in hospitality. But if you make up your mind to do right, they say you're crazy. cities were fought. Folk didn't live in the city. You couldn't raise sheep in the city. You couldn't raise cattle and olives in the city. Folk lived in the country. But when the watchman on the wall saw some danger, he blew the trumpet. And when the trumpet sounded, it reverberated off the Judean hills. And every farmer in his family heard the trumpet sound. And he took off into the city for security. And when they all got in, they locked the door. And they felt secure behind But just before that, a great Savior had walked through that city. And he finally called together those few who believed on him. And he said, when you see. Now everybody else is going to be waiting on the trumpet. But when you see. When you see. Everybody else is going to be waiting on the pipe of the preachers. But when you see. Everybody else is going to be waiting on a message for the temple. From the temple. But when you see. around Jerusalem, which Daniel spoke about, the abomination standing in the holy place. When you see it, everybody else running into the city, you go the other way as fast as you can go. If you're up on the housetop, don't even come down to see about your family. Your family ought to be trained in the truth, so that when you run, they run. If you're out in the field plowing, don't come home to get your wife, tell her to run when you run. forgot to bring enough food. Rome just surrounded the city and cut off the supply. Full on starvation began to set in. Men pulled off their sandals and their belts and chewed on them for sustenance. Women roasted their babies on altar fires and sliced their flesh like slicing turkeys. It got hard inside the city. What about those who heard Jesus? We are told that he had said to them, pray that your fight be not in the winter time, neither on the Sabbath day. And because they prayed and watched, they could see. Did you hear what I said? Thank you. Thank you. Josephus says the fight came on a Wednesday in October. Wasn't the Sabbath and one winter. Everybody who accepted the truth fled. away and not one believer died in the siege of Jerusalem under Titus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Sodom and Gomorrah. Lord have Three patriarchs and prophets says that Lot heard the word from the angel and he took off. Knocking on doors. Full blast day. Finally, he went to his children. Lord have mercy on us. Elder Palmer's father used to tell me, Charles, don't ever stop praying for your children. Even if you're heavy on drugs, don't stop praying. If one of them winds up in jail, don't stop praying. Have you ever heard about intercessory prayer? Many people complain and cry about their husbands and their children and don't spend five minutes a week praying for them. Lot had a burden for his children. Bible also says 
he was vexed at the filthy conversation of the wicked. What do you mean vexed? It's a stronger word than being just disgusted. When you look it up in the original language, it says he was excruciated when he saw the filth going on. He didn't want to watch it on television. He didn't want to watch it on Dallas and Love of Life and General Hospital and all my children and the restless one. And what's that other one? And with lava, and Harry Truman 
has been seen no more. Some fool wrote a song about him, talking about a hero. A man that won't listen to a warning is not a hero. He's a fool. Every time you go to buy a pack of cigarettes, it's written on the side of the pack. Danger. Cigarettes are harmful to your health. They cause emphysema and heart trouble. It's written on every pack. And yet people go headlong and they suck on this poison. And I sit and watch them. And they are not content to suck on it for themselves. They want to blow it across my plate. Men get mad if I say anything. If you went out to buy some dog and it said on the side of the can, warning, this dog food will give your dog hot trouble. You wouldn't buy it. No wonder the angels are amazed. Warning after warning after warning after warning after warning after warning. And we go on in our blood sin as if we don't have to spend eternity somewhere. Ladies and gentlemen, we are receiving now the last warning message. Thank you. God has delivered it unto this church. Billy Graham can't preach it. Jesus died, ten commandments were nailed to the cross. But when Jesus rose, nine of them came up with him. A man like that hasn't got the last warning message. And yet Jimmy Swaggart and Jerry Falwell say that the largest single block of non-holiness people giving to their ministries is the seventh they have the shots. And poor little breath of life can't hardly stay on the air. Amen. You think you're not going to answer to God? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. George Vanderman had to get off a whole lot of stations last year. Running in the red. Supporting Falwell and Swagger, who have said they despise Sabbath keeping. This is that white star syndrome. This is that titanic complex that God will send warning. But men won't listen. Get mad when we preach it. Young folk get mad when I talk about their movies. I told them the other day, I don't even have to talk about your movies. The folks who make them talk about them, when they call them X-rated, they're trying to tell you that even your dog shouldn't watch it. If you don't warn the people and they die, I'm going to ask that you join with me and give me a lead up.